And thank you so much. Let me actually just turn on my camera so you guys can see me. Um, I hope you guys have had a fun week. I'm sorry I couldn't join, but I'm sure Amanda and Lauren have been taking care of you guys. And you guys have been enjoying learning about RNA-seq, gene lab, and how to analyze the data. Um, maybe I can join or provide my email later or something so that you guys can reach out to me and ask questions if you guys have any um, about gene lab or any kind of further things. Um, so I don't know. I don't want to take too much time, but I just wanted to say hi, pop in and say hi, and, and see how things were going. We do have a few minutes. If anyone has any questions for Sam, you guys can open your mics and ask or type in the chat. Can you see the chat, Sam? Yes, I can. So <laughs> let me answer the second one. Um, yeah, Amanda and Lauren really make my job very easy. So it's it's really great having them on our team. Um, so it's it's such a they're just so pleasant. We <laughs> we uh, we love working with them, um, and um, they've you know taken a lot of data that is pretty difficult to deal with, um, and and really made it. Um, available to you know everybody else that is not as great as them to understand it, analyze it, um, and also interpret it. So they're they're just awesome. And then what what is my job? So I'm the deputy project manager. So Sylvan Costa, if you haven't met him, he is our project manager. So I am there to kind of help run the day to day stuff. So I'm I'm more in the details, more in the technical level, um, and he kind of runs the the vision of the project. Um, so. My job is to make sure that my team has the resources to do their job um, and I uh, you know, provide those. And I also help get things like this get started, um, kind of pitch it to our stakeholders and, and things like that. So it's, it's, pretty, it's pretty much a PM role, but we have to do a lot more. <laughs> so that's what I do. Um, but I am also kind of, um, I used to be the data curator, so I also support that quite a bit. So Sam as deputy project manager has much more of the day-to-day -day interaction with everyone on the Gene Lab team. So she gets to listen to all of us complain anytime we need money, anytime we want to do something fun like this, we go to her and beg and complain. Um, so she is just amazing, uh, an amazing person to work with. And then she relays anything that we need her to up to, to Sylvan. And then also takes everything from Sylvan to everything that Sylvan wants to do. Uh, Sam manages it and makes sure that the GLAMP's running well and that everyone on the team is happy. Very, very important role. We're so lucky to have her. You are too kind. You guys, you guys make us look good. <laughs> I just get to present it. So um, anyways, I won't take too much time, but if you guys have any questions um, about anything, just Amanda, Lauren can provide my email and I can definitely ask them all. Oh, oh, that is a good question. Um, so, you know, I don't know if Amanda explained this, but, you know, Gene Lab is an open resource to the community. So the goal is that you guys become the next group of scientists and principal investigators that are the next, you know, generation of scientists that are going to run the spaceflight experiments. Um, so for us and for NASA, it's, it's the way to train the next generation of scientists so that they can, you know, utilize the resources today, but also generate new proposals and hypothesis for the future. So that's kind of what we get out of it. Um, and we, we get an opportunity for people to utilize the data that it is there and that's been generated over the years. Um, yeah. <laughs> yes, that too. Amanda's right. Um, so I hope you guys are enjoying it so much that you guys, you know, turn back and want to do bioinformatics in the future um, and also come back and, and look into space biology in the future as well. Join our AWGs. Any final questions for Sam before we let her go? She always has like 10 meetings at the same time, I swear to God. She'll be like, oh, I got five meetings right now. Hang on, let me do five minutes each. 
Yeah, exactly. And that's the other thing I do. I attend a lot of meetings. Well, I hope you guys all enjoy the last um, few hours of the course. I'm um, sure it's very, very sad, but also very exciting that you guys are almost done and fully made it through the analysis. So um, keep going. And um, I'm, I'm sure Amanda and Lauren have been doing a great job and we can't hear for, to hear from you again. So please drop by, join our AWGs, um, just anything. So <laughs> um, come back come back our way. We do also have a lot of internships. I know there's one following this one, but um, we do it every year. So don't forget about us and, and keep coming back to our site. And, and hopefully, like I said, you guys will be the next generation of scientists flying um, organisms to space. Bye everyone. Thanks for coming, Sam. Of course. Hi, Phil. <laughs> All right, that was nice to see Sam. Thank you guys for asking such good questions. Um, let's keep going here to make sure we have time to finish up in the last couple of hours. Um, we've just, uh, we're just about done with our differential gene expression output table. Um, we've added in five different ways of referring to our genes. We've added in protein-protein um, interactions, which contain the genes that we've searched for as long as they're within that database. And finally, we've added in a column which has a list of um, gene sets. Each of these IDs here contains a, um, refers to a list of genes that are known to act together to affect some biological consequence. And each of these many different gene sets has to include this gene, GNAI3. So how many biological functions involve GNAI3? Um, I can just go ahead and tell you, because I counted it earlier, it's 67. Um, so finally, let's combine this gene annotation table that we've made back together with the DG output table which, remember, has all of our means, standard deviations, log to total change from the, and uh, p-values from the wall tests. So we're just going to use our function cbind and then um, do some a little bit more coding to make sure, uh, go ahead and run this, run this cell. We're going to do just a little bit more coding to make sure that we don't, uh, that the ensemble uh, gene IDs uh, aren't in the row names. So let's run the next cell just to take a look at the first row of the final, our, our very final DG output table. So see here. So I've put in some information at the, um, at the, at the bottom here because the DG output table has so many columns that we actually cannot view them. So it has 31 columns, and if you scroll over to the right, you'll see that uh, some of the columns are hidden to save space. So I've listed down here, uh, we've gone over all of these columns as we added them in, but the DG output table first contains all of our different um, gene ID uh, systems, then the protein-protein interaction and pathway IDs, then the normalized counts for all 12 of our samples, and the, um, then the log two-fold change, the um, p-value and the adjusted p-value for all of our wild test comparisons, the mean standard deviation and p-value across all samples. A quick note here, remember that we went over how there are two different hypothesis tests we could run, wild test or um, the likelihood test. And so in general, the gene lab standard pipeline will generate, um, let me just go back and show you. Oh, we didn't actually put the name here, but um, remember we can run either the wall test or we can run the, here we go, um, likelihood. 
the likelihood uh, ratio test and we looked at the DEC2 documentation. And I noted that the Gene Lab standardized pipeline runs both the likelihood ratio test and the wall test. So if you look at a standardized DG output table from the Gene Lab repository, it will also have columns for the likelihood ratio test p values. But in this exercise, we're just generating the wall values, so there are no um, LRT columns. And then finally, we have the group mean and standard deviations. All right, so the last step of the DG analysis is let's save this table. Um, we're writing it to our DG output folder. And then we're done generating differential gene expression analysis. And we'll be ready to move on to visualization as soon as we're done going over the volcano plots. Hey, Lauren, before you get into that, was everyone able to run everything? Because I just noticed that the mount point um, seems to be off again. Oh, it's back on now. Um, was there anyone that didn't that didn't run that had an issue? Felix, did you have an have an issue, or no, you didn't have an issue? Okay, luckily, okay. Uh, during the break, I copied everything that we need for this notebook from the scratch space while it was still mounted into a local drive, which we do still have access to. So I am going to change um, the paths in one of the blocks and I'll put it in the message and then we could do that run again, uh, all the cells again, while Lauren finishes up her lecture material. So just give me a second to fill in those paths. Thanks, Amanda. So that first code block in step 1A, I want you to replace those paths with the paths that I just put in the chat. All right, so once you've replaced the paths here with the paths that Amanda put in the chat, please go ahead and scroll down to the end of section three. And uh, right before it says for DG data visualization, click on that cell and run kernel, um, restart kernel and run up to selected cell. Please let me know if anyone is having any issues with this. Ivana, were you able to get things working? Okay, perfect. All right, I'm going to switch over to the lecture while everyone reruns, any, anyone who needs to reruns their cells. Um, if you don't need to run your cell, then just don't do anything. I, I didn't have any issues. Um, I'm going to just check and make sure that I can access the variable that we're going to use for visualization by running head neural counts. And I do see the table that I'm supposed to see. So everyone can double check that they still have access to that variable. In the meantime, Let's get back to talking about volcano plots. 
So as I was saying, um, we're, I'm breaking down the volcano plot um, point by point so that we understand what we're looking at. The x-axis plots the log twofold change values for all of your genes, and uh, the y-axis is the negative log of the adjusted p-value. And I just have a, an example negative log plot here for us to look at as the adjusted p-value gets smaller, which is good for us, the negative log adjusted p-value gets bigger. So it's a, just a nicer, more intuitive way to plot. Now, every dot in the volcano plot is one gene, and the dots are colored based on significance cutoffs. So um, we generally, um, we generally set our adjusted p-value cutoff to um, 0 0.05. And in some places we set our log, we can set also a significance cutoff for log twofold change. And the reason that we would do this is a gene can be considered significant according to uh, the p-value, but we also want to make sure that the gene has changed enough it, it to be um, considered significant in a biological setting. So you can have a, a gene that was significant according to p-value because it was not likely for the null hypothesis to be true, but the gene actually hasn't um, changed between the groups all that much. So we do also want to look at the log twofold change. So often we'll set a uh, log twofold change cutoff of um, 0.2. Um, on the plot that we're looking at right now, the log twofold change cutoff is set at one. So the, the log twofold change cutoff goes in either direction, right? So you can have a positive log pole change if your gene is overexpressed in the condition that you're examining, so flight versus ground control. If you have um, a positive log pole change, your gene will be overexpressed in flight. If you have a negative log fold change, it will be underexpressed in flight. So we have a cutoff on either side of zero, at positive one and negative one. Um, and then we show our p-value cutoff with a um, horizontal line because it's against the y-axis. So the way that we assign these colors, so um, the genes that are not significant at all, so they didn't pass the p-value cutoff and they didn't pass the log full change cutoff, are colored in gray. Um, genes that um, only passed the uh, log full change cutoff, so if the log full change between the compared conditions is uh, greater than or equal to um, the absolute value of two, so it could be greater than two or less than negative two, then uh, that gene is colored green. If um, the adjusted p-value on the plot that we're looking at right now, instead of using an adjusted p-value cutoff of less than 0.05, we're actually using um, an adjusted p-value cutoff of less than 10 to the negative 6, uh, because people use different adjusted p-value cutoffs. Um, Sometimes a gene will, like I said, can pass the adjusted p-value cutoff, but not the, um, the log twofold change cutoff. So in that case, if, if the gene has passed the um, adjusted p-value cutoff, this whole area here, the, um, the gene would fall into this area, and that gene would be colored blue. But what we're particularly interested in are these areas of the plot where the log full change is greater than um, uh, absolute value of 2, and the adjusted p-value is above our threshold. So those, those genes are colored red, and we say they've passed both the adjusted p-value and the log two-fold change cutoff. So when we're actually looking at the plot, the different quadrants of the uh, plot are colored so um, below, uh, genes that did not, that passed the log two-fold change cutoff but not the adjusted p-value cutoff are colored in green. And then genes that passed the adjusted p 
p-value cutoff, but not the log two-fold change cutoff are colored in uh, blue. And then these areas are colored in red because they pass both cutoffs. So finally, um, we end up with a plot that looks like this, where each dot represents a gene. And some of the genes that land in the most significant portions are colored, are uh, given their gene names. So it's easy to look at visually. So the different portions of the plots are, we have, we have the legend up here, which again has the colors for non-significant genes, the green genes that just pass log full change, the blue genes that just pass the adjusted p-value cutoffs, and then the red genes that pass uh, both cutoffs. We do have name labels for some of the, and we do have name labels for some of the significant genes. So let's go back to our, um, first of all, any questions on the volcano plot? We're going to make a volcano plot and answer some questions about it in the Jupyter Notebook. But was anything, was anybody lost, anything not clear about what I just showed? There, um, there are values that, uh, for Nicholas's question, they are values that you tell the plot. When you're making the plot, um, you set the cutoff values. So they can change with the data set, they can change with the researcher. Is there any regulation after transcription or are all mRNAs translated to amino acids? Um, there is regulation after transcription. There are, um, there's quite a bit of non-coding RNA activity that regulates the coding RNA activity. So genes can be transcribed, but um, one example of regulation is that they can be targeted by non-coding RNA called microRNA and microRNA are complementary to some region on the, the coding RNA. The microRNA bind to the coding RNA, which targets the coding RNA for degradation by a large protein complex called dicer. So those RNA are then targeted for degradation and chopped up and removed from the cell. So that's one version of regulation after transcription that happens in different settings at different times. Um, yes, that is an excellent question, Felix. So um, many people will argue that if you are only looking at RNA, you cannot say definitively, and I mean, I think this is the truth, you cannot say definitively that you are measuring um, the protein activity, the, the actual activity of these genes in the cell. Um, it does, th this does not happen to every gene. This type of regulation doesn't happen to every gene. It is somewhat well characterized. And the, um, we know the, mi we, the microRNA are pretty well characterized as well. So we are getting a pretty good snapshot of what's going on. Um, in the cell, if we look at RNA sequencing, we look at gene expression. But to be really thorough, it's best to also look at protein data from the same cells taken at the same time, um, which is often not available. And so you always you always do have that caveat. But it isn't it isn't all that common. It doesn't change your data that much. Oh, and there have also been studies showing which genes are most susceptible to that type of regulation. So if you are studying a specific gene that is susceptible to that type of regulation, then you, you should know, well, I should really also be looking at the protein measurements. Just want to share a fun fact about RNA regulation. Um, so microRNAs were actually like a lot of the coolest discoveries in science discovered by accident. These botanists were trying to uh, increase the color of some of the plants that they were working on, of the flower petals. 
And so they decided, because they knew that RNA encoded for the protein that caused the pigment for the color, so they're like, oh, let's just add in some more of this RNA for this uh, protein. And so they did, and what happened is that the single-stranded RNA that they added in that encoded for that protein, well, the endogenous expression of that protein encoding for the pigment, when it was expressed, the RNA that they added both single-stranded RNA are complements of each other, so they came together to bind to make double-stranded RNA. And we have this complex um, that's pretty well preserved, the risk complex that involves Dicer that uh, Lauren was just talking about. And so it recognizes double-stranded RNA, and it binds to it, and it just starts chopping it up and gets rid of it. So when they tried to increase the pigment color, um, to be more purple, or I can't remember what the color was, they ended up getting it a lot less purple and in fact made some albino um, plants. And then later on, that discovery, uh, that accidental discovery was picked up by a worm biologists that were looking into the functions of C. elegans, and they really harnessed uh, what was going on there with the silencing of the RNA. Uh, and they actually won the Nobel Prize back in 2006 uh, for their work. Thanks, Amanda. That's a great story. Um, Phil, um, the genes that are chosen in the plot are uh, chosen by the package to, um, they try to label as many genes as possible without clogging up the plot. So I think it is somewhat arbitrary, um, except that they, are, they do merit attention because they are um, only only the genes that pass both of the cutoffs are labeled, but um, I think that they only label genes until the gene names start overlapping with each other and then they stop. Okay, um, so they merit attention, but equally, um, all the other genes in that region should be should be looked at. Exactly. Thank you. All right. Let's move on to visualizing our data. The first thing that we need to do is to do a log transformation of our normalized expression data. So let's go ahead and run that cell. And then we're going to do a filtering step to just identify the differentially expressed genes that have an adjusted p-value of less than 0.05 and log fold change. Um, of greater than one. Oh, thanks, Amanda. Yeah, is did anyone have any issues? Um, can everyone run this cell that I just ran the uh, log two transformation? Okay, great. We have the same issue now that I can. Lauren, I think you, you can you can keep going. Those of you guys who had that issue, just go ahead and um, start maybe at the DIM DGE P uh, FLC and then press the restart kernel and run up to the cell. That way, by the time it, Lauren's uh, done walking us through, hopefully yours will be caught up. Which, which cell are you talking about, Amanda? Uh, a little bit into where you are. So a little bit into the visualizations, just because- you're, Oh, I see, I see. Yeah, yeah. So just, just pick a block, Lauren, just a little bit down. Like I, I suggested the DIM DGEP FLC, that block. So those of you guys who are having issues, go to that point. Make sure you change your paths up above. And then once you change your paths, go to the block that Lauren's highlighted and do the restart kernel and run up to selected cell. So. 
All right. So we're filtering the DG output table to only show the genes that have adjusted p-value less than 0.05 and absolute value log full change greater than 1. And the way that we do that is, um, again, we're using brackets to slice the DG output table, but we're using it to slice on the value of a specific column. So we're using the um, dollar sign operator to say uh, DG output table, um, uh, take a look at this column, the one that has adjusted p-value. And here we're saying uh, for the ground control versus flight comparison, and then take everything that has a value in that column of less than 0.05. Now, someone asked a question when we were going through the R intro notebook about um, can we use the uh, dollar sign if you have spaces in your column name. And I had mentioned that you can solve that problem by using these little um, little tiny quotes that are on your keyboard next to the tilde. So the reason that I'm using them here is because R does not um, think that parentheses are valid characters in, um, in names, so in column names. So uh, we have parentheses in our column names here but I needed to um, bracket these with the uh, bracket the name with these little quotes instead. And then the dollar sign works just fine. So we're filtering on adjusted p-value less than 0.05. We do the same thing. We, we assign that to a new variable called dg underscore p for having been filtered on the p-value. And then I take that new variable and filter by log full change greater than one, and then uh, log full change less than one. I pass those to two new variables called dgpflc up and dgpflc down. And then I use R bind, which we saw was similar to C bind, to stitch those two data frames together. I then remove rows with NA because um, that will cause issues. And we end up with a new data frame called DGPFLC. So let's go ahead and run that cell and then let's look at the dimensions of our filtered DGE table. So taking a look at this, at these dimensions, um, first of all, I know you all know this, why was the adjusted p-value used to determine significance here rather than the p-value? Yeah, exactly, everyone. So we have um, thousands of variables, and we're using a p-value cutoff of less than 0.05. So we want to, unless we have variables, a uh, number of variables that's much fewer than 20, we have to use adjusted p-value to take into account the possibility of false positives. Now, on to the fun stuff. How many significant differentially expressed genes are there? Now that we've filtered to just differentially expressed genes, how many are there? Yeah, exactly. 768, um, 768 rows in our new filtered data frame. Now finally, Based on the adjusted p-value cutoff that we used, how confident are we? Um, give me a percentage that those these genes are actually differentially expressed. Exactly. Very good we are 95% confident that these genes are differentially expressed because with a p-value cutoff, adjusted p-value cutoff of less than 0.05, we, 
we know there's only a 5% chance that the null hypothesis is true. And the null hypothesis is that these genes are not differentially expressed. So let's go ahead and subset um, our normalized counts matrix using uh, just the significantly differentially expressed genes because we're going to do some visualization that only wants the samples and the gene names and our our differentially expressed our DG table has a lot more stuff. It has all the different gene IDs and pathways and things. So the first visualization we're going to do before we get to the heat map and the volcano plot is we're going to do another principal component analysis using only the significantly differentially expressed genes. Um, so we're going to run PR comp again to calculate the PCs, and then we can run autoplot and GG save. And let's take a look at this plot and think about how it has changed in relation to the last plot that we made using all of the normalized genes. So do you guys remember how has the percent of variance explained by PC1 changed? In, um, from this plot to the previous plot. It's almost tripled, exactly. It is much, much higher. Uh, we went from uh, 20 to 56. Why did this happen? What, what variance in the data set is being explained by PC1? So we got rid of the read depth variance after we did the normalization. So we're comparing this PCA plot to the PCA plot we made after normalization right here. And we said here, you know, if we look at PC1, we're, we're seeing the separation between the biological conditions along PC1, so between flight and ground control. Now, if we look after we've plotted PCA using only the differentially expressed genes, um, PC1, again, is showing the separation between flight and ground control. But the amount of variance that's in the data that's captured by PC1 is almost tripled because we've subset only to the differentially expressed genes. And these are the genes that are differ differentially expressed between flight and ground control. So we're pulling out, we're trying to pull out only this, this signal, only the variance that um, is captured by PC1. When we say we want just the differentially expressed genes, we're saying we're zeroing in on the um, flight, flight condition compared to the ground condition. Just want to make sure that everyone is clear on what is meant by differentially expressed genes. Sure, Amanda, do you want to talk about that? You know, because I just realized that we keep saying differentially expressed genes, not if we like explicitly defined it, uh, what that means. So is, it, is there anyone that, that isn't sure on what it means to have differentially expressed genes? Does someone want to give an explanation of what differentially expressed genes are to show us that you know? Unmute your mic. Somebody step up here. I know it's Friday afternoon, but uh, we got to represent San Jose State. Come on, Spartans. We're at the home stretch. Close. Close. And uh, think about what you said between organisms. Think about that. Um, we're only looking at one organism here. So what, what's it between? 
Yeah, AO, and depending on condition, that's that's closer, yeah, than between organisms. Genes that are different in lead counts or expression levels, Veronica, right? Different between what? So in this particular experiment, different between what? What and what? Um, so from my understanding, yeah, I'm oh, sorry, people are in the chat saying it, just differentially expressed based on the condition of either space flight or on the ground. Yes, absolutely. Um, and just to be really clear, Rashi, um, we have six samples in each condition. So we are comparing all six samples in the flight condition to all six samples in the ground control condition. Okay. I'm not sure what you mean by that. You meant for this one. Sorry to put you on the spot. Uh, no, I just, I, I understand what you meant. I just, I was just explaining like if there was only two samples. So oh, okay. Yeah, if there were only two samples, sure. Yeah. Yeah, sorry. It is Friday afternoon for me too. So if I misunderstand you, um, let's chalk it up to that. <laughs> All right. Um, so can we note anything interesting about PC2? How... Um, how has PC2 changed when we subset just differentially expressed genes? Yeah, it's increased slightly. Um, yeah, it has, definitely has not changed as much as PC1. Um, yeah, PC2 has increased a little bit. Um, I do note also that the structure of the flight data has changed a little bit. So in our previous plot, we had flight data kind of um, spread out across the y-axis in pairs, dun, 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 like that. Now, um, four of these samples have grouped up top and two are down here. So somehow by subsetting to differentially expressed genes, we're um, separating out the flight data in a kind of a weird way. I don't have an explanation for this, but if I were working with this data set pretty closely, I would definitely want to look into this some more. All right. Um, so before we run on, I really just want to nail this point to make sure you guys are really understanding what's going on here. So in the PCA plot before this one, what happened is we normalized the data to take into account differences in read depth between the different samples and also read composition. So that's what the DEC2 normalization did. And then once we remove that, right, so those would be technical bias that was introduced as a result of either library prep or uh, the sequencing run with run depth. And so once we got rid of that noise, we had a set of normalized expression. And looking at that normalized expression, so this is all 12 samples now. So you got your six flight, you got your six ground control samples, and you're looking at expression of all of those 50 some thousand genes that we were looking at. Right, and so now we have normalized expression and then using the principal components, which is just looking at the expression of genes in all samples and seeing where they're most different. And so what it found is that they're most different on this arbitrary line called principal component one in the normalized data. So they were already different based on that principal component. And it just so happens that when you plot the cells or the samples where their gene expression is on that principal component, we already saw a separation of flight and ground control. And so we already saw that there's differences just in overall gene expression. There's going to be differences in your flight samples versus your ground control samples. And then what we just did here to generate this plot is we took that gene expression data and we further subsetted it by looking at that gene expression data and saying, okay, now instead of having all genes, I only want genes that I know 
are significantly either turned up or significantly turned down in flight samples when I compare them to the gene expression in the ground control samples. So any genes that aren't significantly different in any genes that aren't significantly different by at least a log fold of two, so that's more than double, um, we got rid of those. So now the genes that we're left with here in this principal component analysis are only the genes that are very different between our space flight samples and our ground control samples. So now when we plot that principal component and it's looking for the place where these genes expression are most different, it's looking at gene expression of genes that are different between flight and ground control samples because we told it to only use genes that are different between flight and ground control samples. And that's why we see so much more of the variation being accounted for in that first principal component. So most of that variation now, like over half, is just due to if the organisms were flown in space flight or if they were kept here on the ground. We want to make sure you guys are thinking about that right and understanding. How did it account for read composition again? Lauren, do you want to pull up your PowerPoint with the read composition? Oh, the median, the median of ratios. Read depth. Read composition. So that's by using the median of ratios. And by looking at the median, you're not. Yeah. Because when you're just considering the median, Felix, right? The uh, median is when, right, you line things up from least expressed to most expressed. So if you have a contamination, like we saw in that example, to account for uh, read composition, the number of reads aligning there would be like way on the high end when we line up those values of gene ex or of ex gene expression from least to most. And so rather than taking account all of them, you're just looking at the middle value, right? It's kind of like looking at, uh, rather than looking at the average of say, if, if we're talking about how much the average amount of money that Americans make, we have billionaires here. And so if you look at the average amount of money of an adult American across everybody, you, you would think that people make $85,000 a year each. I actually did this calculation, I was curious one time. When in reality, that really doesn't tell you what the majority of people actually make. But if you line it up and take the median, now you get around 25, 30,000 a year. And that's a more accurate representation of, in this case, how much adult Americans make. Um, and so in this case, we're doing kind of applying that kind of same idea to gene expression data to make sure that we're not skewing our data based on the most highly expressed genes, which could potentially be contaminants. And that's how this median of ratios uh, is accounting for the read composition. Cool. Great, thank you guys. Um, all right. So in the interest of time, we're going to skip changing uh, the parameter. Log fold 2 is quadruple, not double. Um, I don't, I don't think it's, it's certainly not double. I don't. Oh, I see what you mean. I see what you mean. Yeah, as Amanda said, um, it depends on what what exactly the fold change is. So I think in the example that, yeah. definitely more than two if we used a fold change cutoff of two then that would be double yeah exactly um, all right let's move on and make our heat map 
um, we went over what what heat map is actually doing in the slides. Um, and we talked about how important it is to scale our data. So here we're going to scale the data between 0 and 1 using um, a mathematical equation in R. So we're going to adjust our x underscore DGE matrix, which has the uh, expression of the differentially expressed G genes. And we're going to uh, uh, point all of the output to a variable, a new variable called x underscore dg underscore scale. Just remind ourselves these are scaled data. Let's go ahead and run that cell. Then we're going to run the heat map function, which comes from the complex heat map package that we imported earlier. When we run this function, we need to pass to it several things. First, we pass to it a matrix of the uh, counts data that we want to make a heat map of. There's an argument called show row names. We don't want to show row names here because we have uh, 768 of them. So they would be piled on top of each other and not really visible. If you had only a few row names, it might be nice to have them listed there. Our title, the title for the rows, here rows are genes. So I've titled our row um, DGEs. You know, differentially expressed genes, and um, in parentheses I wanted to put how many there are, n equals 768. Um, and um, then there's a parameter called heat map underscore legend underscore param, uh, which is the title for the legend. So um, let's see, for Python yeast does the um, part is like lambda. Yes, exactly. Exactly. Good point, Felix. Let's go ahead and run this cell to make our heat map. It might take a minute because, again, it's um, the function has to map all the values for a, a 12 by 768 matrix onto our continuous color bar. But hopefully, everyone has gotten or will soon get a heat map that looks like this. Um, so we can use this, we can just, let's just take a quick look at the heat map and we can see, so what we've done here is take the matrix with normalized gene expression values that have then been scaled we scale them between 0 and 1, so you can see the color bar goes from 0 up to almost 1. We've clustered our genes on the left-hand side, so you can see the genes are all clustering based on similarity. The samples are also clustering based on similarity, so there's kind of a, a push and pull there. So um, the genes are being clustered by similarity in as much as they are also, the samples are also clustered by similar. So what are some trends that you notice? So we have a question here. What, what are the trends that you notice in the expression of the differentially expressed genes in the samples within the same group? So you could see um, when we clustered the samples, the signal is strong enough that all of the ground control samples clustered together on the left and all of the flight samples cluster together on the right. So what's going on within each group? What are the trends that you notice? There's no real right answer here. Just kind of what are you, what do you, what jumps out at you when you look at this plot? The expression between all the GCs and all the flights are similar. So you're saying that um, within the ground control group, there's similar patterns, uh, like all these genes are highly expressed, all these genes are middly expressed, all these genes are really lowly expressed. Uh, yeah, exactly. Uh, A1, there's a band of purple that's interesting midway up on the GC side. Are you talking about right here? Yeah, so... Um, 
what is really interesting to me about this actually is that these genes have really low expression in all of the ground control samples. But what are they doing on the flight control side, or the, the flight side rather? Um, four of the flight samples um, also have really low expression of these genes, but two of the flight samples don't. Two of the flight samples have much higher expression of these genes. And actually, yeah, um, if you go back up, if you do you guys remember, just to be clear, it's ordered them by gene similarity, not by expression level, right? Yes, that's correct, Nicholas. But the but the similarity is derived from the overall expression level. So the when we say genes are similar, we mean that they have similar expression. Uh, do we also look at the hierarchical clustering on the top and left side? Yeah, you can. Um, it's a little hard to see on the left-hand side, but you can tell there's this one big branch where there's a group of genes up here, which are the genes with the highest expression, and then the bottom group of genes have almost all have much uh, lower expression, like under 0.4. But what I was just going to point out here um, is that taking a look at this heat map, you can see that there are two flight samples that have kind of weird expression as compared to the other four flight samples. This is flight rep 2 and flight rep 4. And if we go back up to our PCA plot here and turn on labels, we can see that the flight rep 2 and flight rep 4 are those two samples that we noticed were um, kind of clustering far away from the other four flight samples. So um, if, if, again, if I were diving into this um, data set a little bit more deeply, this would be one avenue I could take to try to explain what's going on with these two samples. I could say, what are these genes? and um, why are they so highly expressed in these two samples? All right. Oh, yeah, thank you. Thanks, Amanda, for doing a deep dive into uh, the quadruple. Um, I'm just going to pause for a second so that everyone can digest this. Amanda, I don't know if you wanted to un make a comment. Yeah, sure, Felix. Sorry, um, I, I don't think I fully understand what you were saying. Um, so I thought you were saying that it was always exactly quadruple when doing the log two full change cutoff. Um, but I think you you might have been hitting the nail on the head. We're saying that it was at least quadruple difference. So if you have, let's say, a count. So if if the average counts across all of your flight samples for gene A is say eight hundred, and the average counts across all ground control samples for gene A is say 200, then the log base two full change, the full change being 800 divided by 200, that value is gonna be two. So when we do a log two full change cutoff, and of course 800 divided by 200, just doing a straight full change is gonna be four, right? So in this context, gene A is quadruple uh, the expression in our flight samples compared to our ground control samples. And that quadruple value is equivalent to a log to um, fold cutoff for that value. So when you're doing a log to fold cutoff, you're saying that you're get taking genes that are at least four times different in their expression between flight and ground control samples, which is a very um, stringent cutoff. So I think that that might have been what you were saying, Felix, and I didn't fully uh, grasp that, but yeah. Thanks, Amanda. All right, any last questions about the heat map before we write it out to a file and then move on to the volcano plot? Awesome. 
So the heat map is, um, it looks like sunset view of the ocean. Yeah, it does. <laughs> Uh, this particular package has really nice colors, very easy on the eyes. The heat map is maybe my favorite way to visualize gene expression data because it can pull out these trends that are hard to see otherwise. So this little group of genes that has distinct expression in a couple of samples. You can cluster samples and identify um, trends that way and, and relate them to genes, whereas clustering with, with PCA, um, you aren't relating anything to genes. It's a little bit harder to pull, pull out what's causing it. Um, yeah, exactly, and it's pretty. <laughs> All right, so when we generated this heat map, we just printed the output to the screen, but in order to save the image to um, a PDF, which is the best way to save heat maps from this package, we need to generate the heat map again, but this time we're going to assign it to a variable, which we're going to call heat map. And um, here you'll notice that I used a an, um, an equal sign to assign this variable, which is fine. You can, you can do that in R. It's better to use the arrow operator, but I think that I had just been coding in Python, and so I was just used to doing equal signs. So let's go ahead and uh, save this heat map to a variable called heat map. And then we're going to use the function save PDF to save this heat map that's stored in a variable. We're going to give it a path to our DG plots folder, a nice name. And then I've specified the width and the height for this plot. Hopefully everyone was able to run those two cells without getting an error. Okay, so now remember we scaled the expression data first. I guess we're not we're not quite moving on to the volcano plot yet, but um, we scaled the expression data and I explained why it's important to scale expression data. But it will be easier to understand if you run if you run the heat map function, make a heat map. Um, without scaling the data. So go ahead and write some code here to create the heat map again without scaled, using data that have not been scaled. And you can put your code in the chat when you're done with it. Um, and uh, I'll, I'll do it myself in a moment, talk about what it looks like. Is it taking a long time to run? Is anyone getting an error? Does anyone not know what to do? All right, so put if yours is finished, go ahead and put your code in the chat. Oh, shoot. Sorry about that, Ewan. All right. Um, Exactly. So, um, has anybody else's kernel died? Hmm. 
<laughs> okay. Um, well, you know what? For the volcano plot, we're going to do a bunch of questions that have you Googling stuff. So um, you're not going to need to be doing coding, just Googling stuff. So I'm going to go ahead and run the heat map without scaling it so we can take a look. Um, and what you'll see is um, if we don't um, if we don't scale the data, you can see it uh, it goes between zero and fifteen. It does look a lot like the unscaled data, but there's definitely a lot more noise going on. The patterns aren't as clean. So um, it's uh, we do get the same result where the flight samples separate from the ground control samples, although you'll notice that uh, for whatever reason the flight samples are now on the left-hand side. Um, yeah, good point, Amanda. You guys can come back and run this on the weekend if you want. Now, let's go ahead and think about so we've done two steps here first we log normalized our data which brings it to about uh zero the the range is about zero to 15 as opposed to zero to two hundred thousand. um then we scaled it to bring it between zero and one now if we've we've just made a heat map not scaling the data but it's still log normalized what if we didn't log normalize the data so this is what I was thinking of when I said that this crashes the Jupiter hub. Um, so what happens if you try to run the, um, the heat map without um, log normalizing the data is it takes a really long time and eventually it oh am I saying log normalize? Yeah, you're absolutely right, Amanda. I should be saying log transform. Uh, taking the log is not technically normalization. And sometimes I just say it the wrong way, but it is it is a log transformation. It is not a normalization step. Thank you. Um, if you don't log transform your data, as you can see, we noted that um, it's absolutely not, not usable, which um, AO and Aon says, yeah, really obscures what we previously observed. Absolutely. Remember, we saw that uh, RNA sequencing data uh, have this really long right hand tail, but the majority of genes have expression close to zero. And that's what we're seeing here. The majority of the genes here have the um, expression that are that's close to zero with very, very few genes having high expression. So it's very difficult to see any patterns. And that is a great demonstration of why we log transform before we do any visualization. So I ran this plot locally to avoid crashing the Jupyter Hub, and I just pasted it into your notebook. OK, so finally, let's go ahead and make um, the volcano plot. And then we'll use what we see in the volcano plot to identify some interesting genes that we can look up on the internet. Um, so we're going to use a, a function or a, a package called enhanced volcano, which comes with its own function called enhanced volcano. We're going to start out by using default settings from the enhanced volcano function, which is log to full change cutoff greater um, than absolute value of 2 and adjusted p value cutoff less than 10 to the negative 6. You guys can play around with these parameters um, on your own time. And there are, a, you can read more about the function and see some nice examples. I put the link to the documentation here. So the enhanced volcano function takes several different arguments. First, we have to provide it with a table that has the log full change column and the adjusted p-value column. We get 
that's what it's plotting. It's not plotting expression. It's plotting the log full change and the adjusted p-value. Then we have to tell it which columns go on the x-axis and the y-axis. So I've given it the name of the log full change uh, column that's measuring log full change between the flight group and the ground control group. Similarly, the name of the y-axis, the, the column that should be plotted for the y-axis, which is the column of adjusted p-value for the world test comparison of flight versus ground control groups. A title, which I called flight versus ground control. Legend labels, which we looked at in the presentation, non-significant log full change, adjusted p-value, or adjusted p-value and log two full change. So these are all the significance cutoffs. Then you can supply it with what's your what's your p-value cutoff? In this case, it's actually an adjusted p-value cutoff. What's your full change cutoff? How large should the points on your plot be? How large should the labels be? And then um, the alpha for the um, uh, for the points, which is the transparency. And then we're in also in the same cell we're going to save our volcano plot using gg save let's go ahead and run this cell and hopefully those of you with a working kernel are able to see a volcano plot that looks like this so we have genes that are not significant at all don't pass any cutoffs here in gray the green genes are the ones that pass the log full change cutoff on either side, but they don't pass our adjusted p-value cutoff. The blue genes pass the adjusted p-value cutoff, so that's in the y-axis direction, but they don't pass the log full change cutoff. So the genes we're really interested in are the, um, the red ones, which pass both the adjusted p-value and the log full change cutoff. And I specifically told it, I forgot to tell you guys this, that I wanted to plot the, the labels of these genes should be the uh, DG output table column symbol because it's easy to interpret those gene names rather than the ensemble gene names. So let's use this plot to answer a couple of questions. <coughs> Excuse me. So first, um, just looking at this plot, which gene has the smallest adjusted p-value that still passes our log full change cutoff? So remember, um, a small adjusted p-value means large negative log p-value. So we're looking for a gene that has a really high negative log p-value and that also passes the log two full change cutoff. Yeah, so reading this plot, I would say the gene with the smallest adjusted p-value, so that's the gene with the largest negative log p-value, so all, we've got to go all the way up here, um, that also passes log twofold change, is going to be GM5532. So Rashi, uh, CNTFR also has a, a, a small adjusted p-value, um, that is a high negative log p-value, and it also passes our log to full change cutoff, but it's not the smallest uh, p-value, okay? Now, uh, zeroing in on this gene, um, is this gene, GM5532, uh, I see, it wasn't sure since GM5532 is on the line. That's a good point, 
but um, I think that's just a kind of a visual plotting artifact. Um, and since it's red, we know that it does pass the log two fold change cutoff. I think it's just so close to the line that the dot uh, was so big that visually the dot actually kind of looks like it crosses the line. Uh, so if you're colorblind, Amanda, would all of these dots look the same? Depending on the severity of your colorblindness. My best friend is colorblind, so we always show her things. It's like, what color is this? And like, everything's brown to her. So. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think in that case, you could also use, if you knew enough about volcano plots, which you guys do now, um, you could use the clue that this gene has been labeled. And we know that genes are only labeled if they pass both of the cutoffs. So that's another way to tell. All right, so is GM5532, is this gene more highly expressed in the flight group or in the ground control group? And how do you know? Remember that we plotted the flight versus the ground control comparison, which means that when we calculate log fold change, we're calculating flight over ground control. So does this gene have, yeah, exactly, Zinru. So this gene um, has a negative long fold change. And we know the comparison was flight versus ground control. So anything positive, anything with a positive log fold change is going to be more highly expressed in flight. Anything with a negative log fold change is going to be more highly expressed in ground control. Is that unclear to anyone? This is a little bit tricky. I'm happy to go over it again. Okay, so remember that um, when we're calculating log full change, All right, remember that when we're calculating log fold change, um, the, um, the comparison that we're doing is, uh, you know, one group over the other group. And we always know, if we're taking the log, we know that the, um, a negative log fold change indicates a lower overall value in the group that's being compared, so the group that's in the numerator, because the, uh, the fraction um, came out to be less than one. Whereas um, if we have the, the, a larger value in the uh, comparing, the compared group here uh, to start out with, then our log full change is going to be a positive. So if we go back over here and we say the comparison that we did was the flight group versus the ground control group, we know that any gene that comes up with a positive log full change means it's going to have a higher expression in the flight group because that was the group that was on top, that's what we're comparing. But any gene with a negative log full change means that it has lower expression in the flight group, meaning it has higher expression in the ground control group. Still, still fuzzy? If you forgot, where would you go to check that? 
I would um, go to my statistics lecture, obviously, um, that you're going to upload. No, no I, I meant if you forgot whether you were doing flight versus ground control or ground control oh, versus flight. Oh, I see. Um, so in this particular case, I know the um, when we at, at Gene Lab when we designed the differential uh, the DGE table, the comparison is in the column name. So it says flight FLT VGC. So I know the comparison was flight versus ground control when I picked those columns to do the enhanced volcano uh, call. So that's what that's what I would where I would go check this if I were using gene lab data. If you're doing your own experiment, um, then you can go back and look at the contrasts that you fed into DEC2. Ah, got it. Does that make sense? Yeah, thank you. Okay. All right. Um, now, let's ask kind of the opposite question. Which gene is most highly expressed in the flight group? So we did flight versus ground control. That means genes that are highly expressed in flight are going to have a positive log full change. So which gene is most highly expressed in the flight group? And does this gene also pass the adjusted p-value cutoff? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, exactly, guys, great. So if we're looking for genes that are more highly expressed in flight, we're gonna say, well, we are looking on the right-hand side of this plot, um, which genes are have a positive log full change since we did flight versus ground control. Um, which gene has the highest positive log twofold change. Well, it's this one way out here, KRT17. Um, yes, it does pass the p-value cutoff because it's red. And we know that this gene is the highest, um, highest expressed in the flight group because there aren't any genes down here in green that come out here that have any higher of a log full change value, right? So in the whole plot, there's one, one gene that very clearly has the highest expression in the flight group because it has the highest positive log full change. So good job. Now let's focus back on GM5532 because um, um, well, I guess this plot uh, when I look at this plot, GM5532 is really interesting because it has the highest negative log p-value. And it's also more highly expressed in ground control, which is kind of interesting. Genes tend to be like more highly expressed in f flight. I mean, if you look down here at the, at the green, there, there are a lot more green genes on the right than on the left. So I'm kind of interested in this gene that's more highly expressed in the ground control. Um, why don't you guys go ahead and see if you can find the biological function of this gene? So, you know, if we were looking into this data set, we made this plot, we'd be like, hmm, what's, what's this gene? What's it doing? What can it tell us about the ground control condition? Can you guys find a biological annotated function on Google for this gene? Go ahead and put in the chat what you find.
So where are you seeing musculoskeletal system? Um, Eowyn, is this the page you're looking at? Yes, so if you look at the tab at the top that says um, tissue X stage matrix. Um, sorry. Um, oh, sorry, here. Yep. Yeah. And then it's going to say, oh, mine looked different. Um, mm -hmm. mm. Well, mine said musculoskeletal system. So. <laughs> <laughs> It, there is one here that it has most musculoskeletal yeah. system. Let's For some reason, I wonder if I have a tab or a filter selected that. Mm. So if we, if we look at the matrix legend, it says that the blue um, means that this gene was present in the structure and or substructures. So uh, this is a... Um, a database that shows the expression of genes in the mouse throughout different stages of development. So mm -hmm. throughout the different embryonic days up here, embryonic day zero through 2.5, so on and so forth. And then on the, all the way to the right has just a, in the adult. Mm -hmm. So it does look like um, this gene is expressed in the musculoskeletal system um, in the adult mouse. So very good. Did anyone find anything different? Did people find this as well? So um, the first thing that I found when I googled this gene was um, a, a page from a protein, the protein database, Uniprot, which uh, says that the, this gene um, codes for a protein that's uncharacterized, um, which is, you know, not as helpful as you'd like. Um, and then here, uh, this, I think this is the page that you brought us to, Eowyn. Um, this is a database. Oh, this maybe this is what it looked like when you looked at it, huh? Uh, as it says, musculoskeletal system. So, yeah, that's sorry, that's it with the feeler stage. Yeah. That's what I, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, this is um, a database that's specific to looking at genes during different times of development. So, while you know, Uniprot may tell us this, this gene is uncharacterized, or that rather the protein is uncharacterized. This database, which has taken a different approach and just said, you know, when during development are genes expressed and, and where in what tissue type, uh, this, this database can tell us that this gene is expressed in the musculoskeletal system. So, so I, I, I'm having a hard time finding information about the gene. I found an entry for the gene on a mouse brain database, but it doesn't say when or where it's expressed. Yeah. Cardiovascular, I looked at NCBI. Um, let's see. Yeah, guys, feel feel free to put your uh, your links in the chat so I can see what you're looking at. Ooh, this is real cool. Yeah, so um, yeah, so the the database that Iowan found um, looks at gene expression by tissue. Similarly, this um, ensemble table that Leah found. Um, also breaks down gene expression by tissue, but also tells us which experiment it came from. So which paper, you know, Greg et al., Mernberger et al., et cetera. Um, because this is really where we get these information. It's, you know, it's from different papers that people published. So it looks like people have found this gene expressed in the heart a bunch, um, also expressed in the brain, which um, 
Nicholas mentioned, so uh, this this kind of confirms what you said, that there is an entry for it in the brain database. Um, a lot of expression in, in the heart, which could be just people were studying the heart a lot. So that this is embryonic development. We're a little more interested in adult because um, genes can be expressed in embryonic development and then not expressed in the heart at all or in the, in the adult at all. Uh, let's see, mouse brain map. Um, let's see, experiment gene profile. So this is, um, this is showing, I believe, staining for this gene in slices of mouse brain. Interesting. Pro orientation anti sense. Yeah, so they um, <laughs> can you get the NASA at left side is working on GM52 <laughs> characterization. Yeah, really. Clearly, we need some better characterization of this gene. Um, yeah, so I think what you found here, yeah, Nicholas, is they stained for a bunch of different genes in the brain, but it's hard to say whether this is high expression or low expression just because of the, the way that these images are reported. Age 56. <laughs> That's a good point. Um, oh, okay. <laughs> Just want to follow the rest of these links. Yeah, so this is similar to the resource that, I think this is the same resource that Eowyn found. It's expressed in all these different tissues. So what we are seeing here is all we can find about this gene is where it's expressed. So we're accessing a bunch of different databases that have um, searched, maybe done a done a natural language processing search in a literature database and found a bunch of papers that found this gene expressed in certain tissues, probably as a, like a secondary finding in another, maybe an RNA-seq expression. Because um, when you do RNA-seq, you find all these genes. So, okay, we found expression of this gene in these tissues but we're not finding a lot on the actual function of this gene. Um, it codes for a protein that according to Uniprot is uncharacterized. So we don't, we're not really zeroing in on its biological function. So the reason that um, we are looking into this gene is because this is a good example of uh, when you're doing an exploratory analysis like this, sometimes you come up with genes where you just, we don't know that much about them um, yet in the field. And GM5532 is an example of that. So, hey, Lauren, before we move on to, to look at the next gene, I do just want to make a point here. So GM5532 is annotated, right? That's why we were able to pull it out. It's annotated, meaning that we know that this is a gene that is transcribed. Um, and we know the coordinates of what it is. That's why we were able to pull it out um, when we did our ran this through the annotation database discovery. So it has this current gene symbol which might change once we know the function. So that's the other thing is all the resources you guys found are awesome. And it also identified that this gene is expressed um, and it's expressed in different tissues at different levels, but a gene being expressed and knowing a gene's function are gonna be two different things. So knowing where it's expressed can give you some hints and ideas about what its function could be, but you'd still need to do a lot more biology to understand what the function of this gene is. Yeah, that's a great distinction. Thank you, Amanda. All right, let's um, 
Oh, let's see a couple. Yeah, tabula mirrors. You know, I've always wanted to use tabula mirrors, but I, before I came to NASA, I didn't work with mice, so I never got to. It's cool. All right. So, last question of the day of the boot camp. Let's look into the function of the gene KRT17 uh, and see if you guys can find an annotated biological function for this gene. And let me know what it is if you find it in the chat. Nice, yeah, so we have found, um, put. so if we search NCBI under gene, we find a page describing this gene, which tells us that KRT17 is also known as keratin-17. So the, this is involved in um, nail and hair formation. Um, there's another page that I found that mentions that it's involved also in um, intermediate filaments. So if you go to genecards.org, um, this, so a human hair in the sample. Well, um, not necessarily. So this this gene page um, is very broad. So this is this gene encodes the type one intermediate filament chain keratin seventeen. It's expressed in nail bed hair follicle. It's also expressed in sebaceous glands, other epidermal appendages, all of which uh, um, mice have. But this is also just an intermediate filament um, gene, which is something that, according to this page, is also involved in responding to um, a physical stress. So it, it's involved in um, skin as well, um, epithelial cell growth, protein synthesis, so it's entirely possible that this gene actually is expressed in the soleus muscle. Um, and it can be, it's possible that the reason that it's so overexpressed in the flight samples is because these mice were undergoing um, microgravity changes and were under a lot of physical stress and the soleus muscle has to respond to that. And so uh, in, in response to trying to um, deal with the changes in the muscle, this keratin gene was overexpressed significantly. Um, it would be unlikely that if there were a human hair in the sample, that it would have landed in all the flight samples and none of the ground control samples, um, and also that it would have there would have been enough of it um, to affect the gene expression. Although it is possible. So my explanation for this has to do with the uh, physical stress that the soleus muscle is responding to. Can I just add one more thing about this gene in particular? Um, so Felix, it is a good point. It could also be a mouse hair too, which would probably be more likely than a human hair unless you have really sloppy um, biologists working in the lab. So one of the first things I would do to address that specific question is go up and look at the expression kind of as Lauren alluded to of that specific gene in all samples, because as Lauren said, if it is indeed expressed primarily just in flight samples and, um, and it's overexpressed in flight samples compared to ground control samples, the likelihood that that contaminant was in, in all the flight samples and on the ground samples is going to be very uh, slim. The other thing, it, again, that Lauren alluded to is that 
genes can have multiple functions depending on where they are. So it's the what, the where, the, the when that genes are expressed are going to tell us what they do. So we do have so much redundancy uh, on the molecular level, which makes us super efficient. It also makes molecular biology very confusing sometimes. Um, in one paper, I do want to point out, which is interesting, I, I just put the link to the PDF in the chat. So if you open up that paper and just do a control F to find the KRT17 gene, so this study in particular was a study looking at the changes of gene expression under hypoxic conditions. So hypoxic being low oxygen. And we know that on the International Space Station, there's lower oxygen than there is here on Earth. And so what you see in that paper that I just sent, if you look up that gene, it is overexpressed in hypoxic conditions. And so that's another thing that could tell me that this is, is a true change that we're seeing, just because we know that there's hypoxic conditions on the space station, and that would, of course, impact the muscle tissues and, and the response in those muscle tissues to that environment. Yeah, thank you, um, Amanda and Felix. Um, I don't remember exactly where I saw stress, but um, I do see here involved in tissue repair. So uh, it could be overexpressed trying to repair the soleus muscle, muscle which is um, under stress from the microgravity or hypoxic conditions in space. Uh, but not from, I don't get that from the NCBI entry. No, I get that from gene cards. And then I just, uh, Amber sent me a message privately asking again about the possibility of contamination from the skin. So Amber, it, it is possible. It's always going to be possible. And that's why um, one way to check this that I had mentioned is I would go and I would look at that differential expression table and do a control F for that gene and find it. And if it's expressed to a high level, which it seems to be in all flight samples and a much lower level in all ground control samples, the only way that that could still be a contamination is if it happened to be contaminated in only flight samples and not ground control samples. And the, the contamination level from the skin would have to be roughly the same if the expression of this gene is the same in those um, flight samples. So that's how you can go and kind of check and kind of get some information to give you a clue if it's a possible contaminant or not. Yeah. Let's hold on to that question because it's, it's kind of a big one and I did promise you that we're going to address it and we are. I just want Lauren to uh, wrap up. So what we're going to do is I'll have Lauren uh, wrap up this Jupyter Notebook. Uh, Lauren, in the wrap up, um, maybe you could show them. I know you have one more graph and people can play around with making more graphs, but after you talk about that challenge, show them how to make a copy of the Jupyter Notebook, how to reset uh, the kernel and clear all outputs. I know we've been resetting and just running with the reset. So that way you guys will be able to uh, run these again next week if you guys want to while you still have access to the cluster. And then we'll do some closing remarks because I know that it's late. And then anyone who wants to hang out who is interested in hearing more about Spikins, um, Marie, who's been doing a lot of work and put together a nice Jupyter notebook to analyze Spikins and RNA-seq data, she'll give you guys a little overview of, of how we do Spikins in RNA-seq data. Thanks, Amanda. So we are actually at the end of this notebook. And the last thing is a challenge that I'm going to let you guys work on on your own time because some of you don't have working kernels. But the challenge is to just play around with the different um, cutoffs and settings for the enhanced volcano plot and make a new volcano plot. And then you can um, also take a look at the enhanced volcano documentation if you have questions. So as Amanda said, you can make a copy of this Jupyter Notebook by um, going to File um, and Save Notebook As, and then you can save it um, as a new file name. And then if you want to reset the notebook and clear all the outputs, you just go to Kernel and Restart Kernel and Clear All Outputs. And then you can download uh, the the notebook with, oh, you might want to download before you reset all the outputs. 
um, as, an, as an HTML by going to File and Export Notebook As. So that's it for me. Thank you all so much for being such a great group. This has been really fun. Thank you so much, Lauren. Um, so I'm just going to do a, a few closing remarks, then open it up to Lauren or Phil to see if they have any additional closing remarks. Um, and then for those of you guys who want to hang out and hear about uh, RNA Seek Spikens, uh, Marie will give like a, a 10 minute uh, kind of overview of what Spikens are used for. Can we all start with talking? Yeah, so um, Lauren, I'm going to go ahead and steal the screen from you. Can you guys see my screen here? Email. We can, but it's kind of small, like very small. My screen's really small? Yeah, like if you can zoom in. Oh, yeah, yeah. To the text, you mean, is small? Yeah. OK, yeah. Um, so I just wanted to show you guys. Where's my Google Drive? Here it is. OK. Is that better? Yeah. The size? OK. I'll also open up this chat so I can have it on here. Um, so on the Google Drive, guys, uh, again, this is the main Google Drive. So I broke it up, the materials that we went over, based on each day. So just to kind of go through, I'll use uh, yesterday, day four, as an example. So when you go to the day, you'll see two subdirectories, uh, subdirectories for the recordings. And then if you go in there, you will see uh, a number of recordings based on how many segments uh, we were teaching during that day. And so at the end, I know they're long file names. Um, at the end of that file name, you'll see a part number. So part one of four, two of four, or one of five, two of five, depending on how many total parts. And so uh, that'll be in the order in which the information was presented during that day of the boot camp. And so the only caveat is I think I told you guys that one recording was messed up. The my talking and what I'm doing on the computer are totally off. And I think it was just more confusing than anything. And that was the start of the Unix Jupyter Notebook where we did uh, Mike's Binder stuff. So unfortunately that video is not available. So you'll see a missing part in the uh, day one. But other than that, all the other recordings will be there and I'll upload these ones tonight. So they'll be there uh, later tonight and I'll shoot you guys an email and those are available. So these are all the recordings and you should be able to watch it right from your browser. So you don't have to like download these videos or anything unless you want to. In addition to the recording subdirectory for each day, you're also going to see a file subdirectory. And these are going to contain all the files that were used during, during that day of activities. So, um, and any additional information. So in here, uh, this is my whiteboard of the description between the splice junction overhang options that we talked about in STAR. You'll also see a PDF version of the stuff from the RNA-seq overview. I don't know how long we will you guys have access to the drive. I don't plan on, on removing access to the drive anytime soon. So um, probably not for at least six months. You'll probably have access for at least six months. Uh, and then at that time, I'll make sure that I shoot you guys all an email uh, before I take this stuff down. Because I am eventually going to move all this stuff over into a GitHub repository. And then when I take it down from, from the Google Drive, which of course only you guys have access to, so I'm, I need to make sure that I clear all this stuff uh, with NASA before it's like open to the public on a GitHub repository. So once that happens, I'll take it down from here and I will shoot you guys an email before I do that to let you know that I'm doing that and also to give you a link of the new location of where it's gonna be on GitHub. Um, so in addition to, to the lecture files and any additional files, any of the Jupyter Notebook stuff is gonna be in here. So for instance, we did the FastQ to Counts Jupyter Notebook, we finished it up on this day. So we also did it on day three, but because we finished on day four, the notebook material is gonna be on the day that we finished because that's the full Jupyter Notebook, and the IPYNB is going to be the notebook that you have to open it up in Jupyter. Um, but if you guys don't have Jupyter downloaded, you, I have the completed Jupyter Notebook in HTML format that you can click on. And then for this one in particular, in this HTML file, the only thing that didn't come out was the uh, multi-QC reports and the FastQC reports. So because of that, you'll also see these HTML files for the FastQC and MultiQC reports that are covered 
in the fast cute accounts Jupyter notebook. So you'll have a blank notebook here, and then you'll have a completed notebook that you can view in a web browser. So you can see what all the what everything looks like filled in. And I also have, because there's questions, of course, embedded within each of these notebooks, the challenge questions that we went over. And so you'll see an answer key for all of the questions that are, um, that are asked in the Jupyter Notebooks. So you should have everything you need to basically walk your guys and selves through this all over again um, for each day of the boot camp. So if you go through and there's something missing that you wanted to see in there, please shoot me an email and uh, let me know if there's something that, that I didn't put up there that I said I would, and I'll make sure that, that I get that um, quickly up there. So, and, and speaking of that, I highly, highly, uh, Stephen was nice enough for everyone, even if you're not a San Jose State student, will have access to the San Jose State cluster uh, for at least the next week. I highly recommend that you guys take the time to go through this stuff once more while you have access to the cluster, because um, it really helps going through it again after you, you know, had some nice night's sleep and a couple a day or two break um, from the material to kind of revisit it. It'll solidify some of these concepts and uh, how, how we do these analyses. So I highly recommend that. For those of you who are San Jose State students, uh, you guys have access to the cluster until you graduate. So. You can do it next week or you can do it when the next semester starts, if you want, whatever you like. Um, any more questions on files, access to files, access to anything that we went over during the boot camp? Okay, if there are no more questions, uh, a couple other things. So I'm going to be emailing each of you guys individually this certificate of completion. Uh, this one obviously is for Eowyn uh, that I'm using as an example. And so uh, this is just to, so that you guys can, are recognized for all the work that you did. Uh, this certificate is compliments of Sam, our deputy project manager, along with some help from uh, Sigrid, who uh, used to be on the science team at Gene Lab. She's been uh, in and out of the, of the course all week. Uh, and then Lauren also helped uh, put this certificate together. So thanks to those three for putting this nice, pretty certificate together for you guys. So I'm gonna, and it's signed by our deputy project manager, Sylvan, who you guys all met today, and also um, by Diana Lee. So Diana is the deputy portfolio manager of the Space Biology Project, and Gene Lab lives under the Space Biology Project, if you guys can remember from my introduction to uh, NASA and Space Biology lecture. Um, so they both signed it. They're, they're really happy to have allowed the resources for us and our time and effort um, to be able to put this together for you guys. So uh, I'll email each one of you guys a copy. Let me know if any one of you guys wants a printed version of this on nice paper. I know some people really like something tangible. Other people, especially um, people that grew up with computers are perfectly happy just to have an electronic copy. But if you guys want a hard copy of this, let me know and we'll print it out on some nice paper and I will get it to Phil. And you guys can, um, maybe I'll ask Phil to, to keep him in his office, Dr. Heller, and you guys can drop by next time you're at San Jose State and pick him up. So please let me know if you want a printed copy of this and I'll be happy to give it to you. Uh, so take this like this. Oh, go ahead, Eowyn, Dr. Heller. Uh, good plan. Everybody get the hard copy. Come visit me. Yeah, so, so we'll get those hard copies to Phil so you guys can pick it up if you want a hard copy. Um, if not, that's fine. Uh, a, when you, your hand is raised. Uh, yeah, I had a quick question and I thought maybe this was an appropriate time to ask. For sure. I'm, I'm trying to put together or update my CV having graduated and including in, uh, to send it out to um, potential PIs. And I'm wondering if this is something that's appropriate to say and how you might say it on a CV or resume. Great question. Absolutely put this on your CV or resume. Um, so, so some people, it, uh, it depends, right? Uh, if you, yeah, so I'm actually, oof, I don't know if I can open this up to you guys, maybe. So I'll, I'm going to ask, so I'm actually part of the, um, I'm part of the Early Career Network. At NASA Ames, I'm pretty active in it, and the Professional Development Committee of the Early Career Network. We're actually putting together. Um, oh yeah, let me let me take a break here. I forgot Dr. Heller has to leave, so I want him to go ahead and say what he wants to say um, <laughs> as he's late for his meeting. Go ahead. 
Okay, thanks so much. Come on camera, there we go. Um, well, I can't say anything right now that wouldn't be dead obvious. Um, it's just amazing what an experience this was. Um, deep, deep thanks to our instructors and deep, deep congratulations to, um, to all the attendees. Um, I'm rushing out the door because uh, I'm about to um, spend a lot of time out in the field. So it'll be hard to get me, but um, if you email me, um, eventually I'll get back to you. So um, again, congratulations to everybody. Please excuse me for running out and um, uh, back to you, Amanda. Goodbye, everybody. Yeah, and also uh, just before Dr. Heller leaves, a big thank you to all the work that Dr. Heller uh, put into this and for uh, the many, many meetings of collaborations that, that we've had over the past couple of years to make this happen. So super happy that, that we were able to finally make this happen. Really excited about it. Couldn't have been done without you. Thank you so much. Bye, everybody. Bye. Um, Okay, so uh, what I was telling you guys is I am a part of the Early Career Network at NASA Ames, and we're going to actually be setting up a workshop, an RNA or a resume and a um, LinkedIn profile building workshop. Uh, we're actually, I'm actually hosting three of them. Well, I'm not hosting. I found people to host three of them. So they're going to be hosted by professionals in resume building and in LinkedIn profile building. Um, the first one is actually set for two weeks from yesterday. And so um, she will be going over just all the details of what you should have in your resume, how it should be structured. And this would be a great question to, to ask someone like that. Um, that's not my area of expertise. Uh, what I do is, is I'll put like a little section that says certificates or additional training in my resume and list things like certificates of completion or if you know how there's a lot of free online courses nowadays if i take one of those um, i'll put that information in like a section of my resume like that i don't know if that's that's the best thing to do i'm hoping to learn as well during the workshop so i will ask if i can open it up to to you guys and send you that invite um, and if i can i'll definitely do that it, it's about a four hour long half a day, four hour long workshop, nothing like this, um, but just to kind of go over all the details of that because that's super useful and so important. Yeah, of course, no problem, guys. Um, but yeah, that's a good point. You definitely should include things like this on your CV or resume. Um, this skill set in particular is uh, very useful in across biotech, right? So we're in a biotech hub of course, here in the Bay Area. So having a note of this on your resume that you've been through a course like this uh, is definitely going to be beneficial for you guys. So yeah. Um, okay. Uh, so with that, the last thing I have for you guys is I really want you... Um, all my stuff's all over the place here, obviously. One of my files is the link that I want to send you. Here it is. Um, so just like you guys all took a pre RNA SIG bootcamp survey. Uh, I want you guys all to uh, complete a post RNA SIG bootcamp survey. So this one's going to take you a little bit longer. It has a few more questions than that initial one, but it still shouldn't be longer than about 15, 20 minutes. Um, and I'm going to ask you to please complete that by the end of next week. Uh, the so sooner you complete it, of course, the fresher this is going to be in your minds. And guys, when you're when you're filling out this survey, I would really, really appreciate your brutal honesty. Um, so tell us what you like, tell us what you didn't like, tell us what things could have been better, tell us what things you absolutely hated. You're not gonna hurt my feelings. I would rather you guys give us some very critical and honest feedback because that's the only way that we'll be able to improve uh, when we host this again. Hopefully we'll be able, to, be able to host again in the future. So please be very honest when you're filling out those post RNA seek bootcamp survey forms. And then I just want to end by telling you all how amazing this has been uh, for me. You guys have been keeping up with this ridiculous, complex material and information. You guys have been sticking with us all the way through in these very long, grueling days. Uh, I know this is a boot camp, and I think we lived up to that name. Uh, and I've just been super impressed with your guys' questions. I've been impressed with your thoughtfulness. Um, in your questions, and um, I'm really looking forward to uh, the internships for those of you guys who are going to be hanging out with us for the next week to do internships. 
And uh, with that, I want to hand it off to Lauren if she has any final remarks. And then as promised, uh, Felix, and for anyone else who is interested, uh, Marie has agreed to hang out for an additional about 10 minutes to talk and give a brief overview of what we do with RNA-seq uh, in terms of spikens. So Lauren, I'll let you take it away. Yeah, I just want to reiterate what Amanda said. This has been really fun. We put a lot of work into it, and I feel like it's absolutely paid off. It was really fun hearing questions that I had never thought of before. It really challenged me to think about how best to present this material. So you guys are great, and I really look forward to working with those of you who will be joining us for an internship this summer. I will need to jump off in a couple of minutes, so enjoy the last bit of the boot camp, and thanks, everybody. Thank you, Lauren. Okay, so for those of you who are just super tired and have had enough, um, I totally understand you're not gonna hurt my feelings if you drop off uh, the meeting and go enjoy your weekend. I will continue recording, so that way everything that Marie goes over uh, will be in a recording. And for those of you guys who are interested and in, wanna be here for the live uh, overview of the ERCC, which is are the synthetic genes that we use to spike into RNA, I will hand, I will stop sharing my screen so that way Marie can share her screen and talk to you guys about some of the nice work that she's done looking at how to analyze uh, ERCC spikens in RNA-seq data. And then I will be in contact with you guys through, um, through email to let you know when everything is available. Uh, and again, please don't forget about that post RNA-seq bootcamp survey. That's going to be really important for us. Okay, I'll stop talking now and let Marie talk to you guys about ERCC. Hi, um, this is my first time sharing through Cisco WebEx, so just bear with me. Can you see my screen? Yeah, we can see it. Okay. So um, Amanda talked to you about um, ERCC spike in. And in general, for RNA-seq, we have to um, kind of, uh, actually, the origin of this is many years ago, um, when RNA-seq was first established, um, companies and um, academics wanted to standardize um, different types of RNA-seq because this came after microarrays. Hey, Marie, sorry to interrupt. I just wanted to make sure you're not trying to share slides right now because I just see your WebEx view on your screen. Yeah, I'm trying to share slides, but let me um, so share. Yeah. Do the same. So stop sharing and then share your, your whole screen. Can you see now? I think you can see now, right? Not yet. It's black for me. Maybe stop sharing and then Let me navigate my slides. There we go. Now we're seeing your slides. Okay, so that was a delay. So basically, um, a consortium was introduced to, um, and this is a, a standard uh, government sector that uh, helped to develop this kind of standard. So what it is, is basically introducing um, really short RNA that comes from a library, right? It's just, it's a library um, that mimics the mRNA to uh, trace the technical analysis of RNA-seq and also the um, data analysis of RNA-seq. And so there are 92 spike ins, and they are subdivided into four groups. And what they are are just um, dilutions of the short RNA. So what you have are 23 transcripts in each of these four groups. And how we use them, we use mix one for, let's say, ground control sample, and then mix two for space flight sample. And this dilution is really tiny compared to your real RNA sample that you have. And we introduce it into our library prep that Amanda introduced to you all the way to the sequencing um, to kind of give us some idea of like the abundance of these transcripts that show up in the kind of library prep we're doing. 
So when you have mix one uh, compared to mix two, with each of these subgroups, what you get is a fourfold difference, a onefold, and a 0.67 and a 0.5 fold. So this is kind of like analogous to the fold change that Amanda, um, Lauren introduced to you about how we look at DGE. So I will kind of reiterate some of this stuff. So this paper that I uh, put in the chat uh, was introduced and it's written in R to give us an idea on what it means when you start with two different depths, two RNA-seq depths. So 40 million um, is an acceptable standard, but for us, as Amanda mentioned, we use 60 million. And then there's this ultra deep. So ultra deep is like above 100 and all the way to 250 million. And this is not very practical because it's very expensive to do. But what it points out when you have ERCC introduced into your sample is that you normalize first to your RNA sample, right? So you divide that. So whatever the ERCC divided by your RNA input, then you take the counts, remember um, Amanda introduced to you RSCM counts. But in this particular example, this is another kind of counts. But what it points out is the um, what the depth means in terms of the concentration. So the gradient that is detectable in the sequencing. So this is just looking at concentration of ERCC relative to counts. And what it shows us is that when you have 40 million, your range, this is in log two now, is from log two of five to 20. But if you have ultra deep sequencing, then you can reach from zero all the way to 20, right? But again, this is not very practical. So another way to look at it is how many of those subgroups can you really detect when you have 40 million read depth and when you have ultra deep? Um, so to back it up, the vendor that we buy from is Thermo Fisher, and this is their catalog describing what kind of dilution of spike in you add to your actual sample. So our standard for RNA, like your flight or your ground control sample, we start with for library prep is around 500 nanogram. So that means your mix one or mix two, you first diluted one to 100, and then you only add one microliter of that into your RNA. So I told you that it's very, very dilute to begin with. So to look at that and look at the counts and see what is detectable in that read depth, right? Um, so this plot generally tells you how many of those ratios that I mentioned when you compare them from mix one to mix two, can you really detect out of each of the 23 subgroup inside of mix one and mix two? And so for 40 million, you can detect up to 16 out of 23 if you're looking at the ratio of four to one, one to um, one to 1.5 and one to two. This is considered one to one and this is if you cross this line, it's considered a guess. So for from 40 million all the way to ultra deep, so of course you would be able to detect like almost perfectly, right? So you would detect 22 out of 23 spike ends if you have like, you know, ultra deep uh, seek depth. Um, but again, we, we, in practice, we do closely, uh, more closely to this kind of uh, practice. Um, and another thing I wanted to introduce why um, having spike in as part of your standard is important in RNA-seq is that there is a limit of detection, right? So for our um, data, the differential expression model, we use DEC2, as I mentioned, but this study, uh, which was done uh, a long time ago, used a kind of a different kind of DE model but similarly, what they wanted to show is that when you do uh, your p-value, right? So after you, you've done the counts, you normalize the data, then you get to the p-value and the log twofold change, right? And then, so what you wanna know is, let's 
remember the ratio I introduced, ratio of one to uh, comparing mix one to mix two, and there are four of them. So what this tells us is that when we do a specific type of DE model running at 40 million depth to ultra deep depth, what you can see is based on the counts of your, uh, your data, right, the counts relative to the P value. And this is analogous to your log to fold chain. So whatever the change in the comparison or the contrast of the flight to ground or ground to flight, you can detect um, at that average count for that ratio, which is kind of analogous to the log to fold change. And you can see that with ultra deep, you can detect a lot more of your um, counts relative to the ratio. So with that, I just wanted to let you know that Spike In provides some additional information to your RNA-seq depending on your read depth range that you have. And this gives you confidence in the kind of counts you are uh, observing from your model. And it also points out some technical and analytical limitations by the concentration of the RCC relative to the sample. Um, and, you know, remember that I mentioned that this is a technical um, uh, analysis, right? So we also look at it as a way of like, what did, did we uh, ensure, you know, homogeneous type of pipetting when we were doing library prep or when we were normalizing for sequencing and all of that? And finally, what's important is that it kind of reflects in terms of your depth in what the content of your sample is, right? So is that range really capturing mostly abundant transcripts? Can you really detect rare transcripts if you are at that read depth that you are uh, sequencing? So I just wanted to end with that for you. Great. Thanks so much, Marie, for that quick overview. And I know this is, this is another kind of in-depth topic that is highly debated in bioinformatics. So um, some bioinformaticists hate it. Some bioinformaticists really like it. Um, so, some caveats, as Marie was saying there at the end, that if you don't have very accurate pipetting when you're spiking in these ERCCs, then um, the information you get at the end is obviously going to be biased um, if, you, if you're not accurate with your pipetting. So that's one big one. The other thing is that, as Marie mentioned, uh, these spike-ins happen uh, at the, after RNA extraction. And so it's, they're spiked into your RNA. So it'll undergo library prep along with your samples. And so it can control from what happens in library prep and sequencing if you use these genes to normalize your data. Um, but if there's any kind of technical differences or issues that happened like during the RNA extraction or during the experiment or during the dissections, that's not going to be picked up and you're not going to be able to normalize for that using ERCC. Um, and then again, of course, you could be skewing your normalization if that ERCC isn't pipetted exactly. So in Gene Lab, this is another big thing that we debated is, are we going to normalize based on the ERCC spike-in or not? And so we really couldn't come to a decision. So we actually offer both. So we normalize based on ERCC spike-in, and we also provide data that's been normalized based on just overall what the data structure looks like in general. So um, what we did with Lauren is during that DEC2 step with the size factor normalization, uh, followed by using that median of ratios algorithm, what we do is we looked at the whole data, right? So we looked at gene, all gene expression across all samples, and that's how we did the normalization. For if you're normalizing based on ERCC, that first step in the, um, let's see if I can pull it up in my notebook here. I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. Uh, can you guys see my screen? It's the notebook that we ran with Lauren, the DEC2 notebook. So if you guys remember when we were running through and doing our DEC2 normalization, so I'll start here. Uh, oops, a little bit too big. Just making it kind of big. 
So this has, we looked at normalized counts and then we went ahead and started normalizing. So remember DEC2 works in a three-step fashion. That first step is to do that size factor estimation. And so normally um, using a function of DEC2 called estimate size factors. So normally uh, when we don't have ERCC spike in, we estimate the size factors again, just based on expression of all genes by creating, um, by doing the median of ratios algorithms that Lauren went over in her lecture. However, we can do this step, but just consider the ERCC spiked in genes. And if you remember during Marie's lecture that she just gave, there are four different groups of ERCC genes, and you also have two different mixes. And so in mix one, Group A, you have group A, group B, and group C, and group D, ERCC genes. And in mix one, they're all one concentration, and in mix two, they're all a different concentration to give you those ratios of either uh, fourfold, uh, a half fold, right, or, or 0.5 difference, and um, 0.63 difference, and then you have a one to one ratio as well. And so because samples are spiked in with either mix one or mix two, when we do normalize using just the ERCC genes and no other genes, um, what we do is we only include the ERCC genes in group B because group B ERCC genes are the same concentration in mix one and mix two. So when we're doing the normalization, we want to make sure that we're using the same concentration of all of the genes that we're normalizing based on. So I personally, because of all the issues you can have, um, because of all the issues you can have with differences in pipetting and because it doesn't control for everything really that came before library prep, I personally say don't use the ERCC normalized data. However, what I do really like ERCC spikings for, as Marie showed, is it can give you an idea, first of all, of your relative concentration because you know the concentration of these ERCC samples. And so Marie didn't show this, but in the Jupyter notebook that she created, uh, and Marie, can you put a link to that Jupyter notebook that's on GitHub so they have it in the chat? Um, okay. What you could do is you could basically create a standard curve based on your concentration of your ERCC genes and the number of counts that you get from sequencing. And then, right, so if you have, imagine just you have a graph and then you have concentration of your ERCC genes on the x-axis and you have the counts, the read counts that you have for those genes on your y-axis, and it's going to be a regression, right? And you would hope that, uh, again, if you have accurate pipetting, that the higher the concentration of the ERCC genes, the more counts you would get, right? Because the more stuff you put in. So you would think that that would be a linear ratio, and now that can help give you some idea of what the expression of your actual genes are. So now if you're looking at gene A, for instance, and you have a count of, uh, and you have it expressed at 800 counts, now you can go to your ERCC graph and say, okay, if I have an ERCC count of 800, what was that concentration? And then you could assume that that concentration is going to be roughly equal to all genes that have that 800 count. So it's nice for giving you a relative idea of expression of your genes in your starting samples. It's also nice for what Marie did show is understanding how many counts or what read depth you need to be confident that you're seeing the full change um, that the data is telling you. And so what she showed is, remember, you have those four different groups of ERCC genes, and then you have mix one and mix two, and they give you those different ratios or different full changes of expression when you compare those ERCC genes from your mix one spike samples with your mix two spike samples. And then you can see, okay, if I have, um, if I have, you know, if I have 10,000 or 10 million reads, I know that I can detect a fourfold difference in my samples because I can detect what I know is a fourfold difference in those ERCC spike ins. And so that was the, the graph that she showed with all those lines. And you noticed that you were more confident in those lines um, and where they fell on the count and being able to detect that ratio if you had a deeper read depth. And so that can give you an idea of when you're trying to figure out, oh, what read depth do I need if I want to see changes at the resolution of, you know, only, let's say, two thirds. So if a gene is, or three halves, right? So if a gene is 
uh, three over two more expressed in one set of samples than the other. That's going to require like some fine resolution, right? So you're probably going to need a, a deeper read depth. Using these ERCC spikings can, can help answer some of those questions. Again, this is, this is a, a big conversation. This is a big discussion in RNA-seq and RNA-seq data. It's highly debated in the literature, the use of these ERCCs for spiking. But I know you guys asked the question. You guys have not asked easy questions. I love it. Um, that means that you guys are really picking up and understanding uh, this stuff. And it really has forced me to uh, revisit some concepts that I had forgotten about and to learn more, more things. Um, that's pretty much everything, unless there's anything else, Marie, you wanted to add? about ERCCs? No, you guys are really awesome. You ask very advanced questions in terms of what we think about in our daily work. Yeah, thanks Marie. And then uh, Marie did mention in the chat, thank you for bringing that up, um, is that she has run that specific notebook for ERCC in a Google Collab. And she starts by taking the, um, the gene expression data that we have uh, on our repository. And so if you use her notebook, you'll be able to pull data from whatever data set you want. Well, RNA-seq data set, of course, that you want that's uh, been processed on GeneLab. You'll be able to pull that data into the notebook that she has and take a look at ERCC expression. And so Marie uh, uh, recently, fairly recently finished putting that notebook together. It's really nice, got a lot of information. And she's been running all of our data sets that we have ERCC spike in through that notebook to, to give us an idea and answer those questions that, that we think ERCC spike are good to answer. Yeah, just test it out. Yeah, play around with it. And again, if you have questions, uh, feel free to reach out to me. And anything I can answer, I'll pass you off to Marie since she's been one really uh, intimately involved in that project. Okay, guys, we are 14 minutes over on the last day of a grueling week of a ton of information. I, uh, I like, you guys are admirable for sticking with it so long, um, especially after being in a pandemic, and I'm sure you're so exhausted from having to be taught through a screen. Um, but I really appreciate you all. I appreciate you all being here. I appreciate you all staying engaged. It really makes my job a lot more fun. And although I had to do homework every night, uh, that makes me makes me aware that, that you guys were really picking up on stuff. So um, I appreciate it. And in my email that I sent out, in addition to resending you guys the link to the boot camp survey uh, and letting you know about the recordings, I am also going to send out a link to encourage you guys all to join the AWGs. If you guys are interested in this stuff and want to keep analyzing data and do it in a collaborative fashion and have the option of getting some publications, uh, joining AWGs is going to be a way to go. And also with the AWGs, not only could you possibly get on a paper, I know you're technically doing free work when you're in AWG, but you do get the benefit of potentially getting on a paper depending how much work you want to do. And also when we have, remember there's a ton of bioinformaticians as well as scientists in our AWGs from all over the country, even all over the world. So whenever they have a job come up in their lab, they give us that job posting and we send it out to all of our AWG members. So also just being involved in the AWG will give you access to some opportunities that you might not otherwise know about. Uh, any other final questions before we close off for the week? No more questions? Yeah, thank you guys all so much again for all of your attention. I know it's been exhausting. I hope you guys have a really relaxing week or weekend ahead of you. And for those of you guys doing internships with us next week, I will see you on Monday. Thank you very much, guys. Take care.